From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We're in our Palo Alto studio today. Um, the COVID thing is continuing to go and, and one of the huge impacts, right, is, is obviously in the conference business, our world, those things have all been canceled or made virtual. Um, and, and everyone's still trying to figure out what does a virtual event look like? What are the characteristics of it? And we're really excited to have one of our uh, favorite CUBE alumni, guest host uh, extraordinaire, Keith Townsend. You know him as the CTO advisor joining us. Keith jumped in with both feet, like right when this thing went down and said, I'm going to have my own CTO advisor virtual conference. So first off, Keith, I miss you. Great to see you. You know, we haven't run into each other at the Sands in an awfully long time. So great to see you. How you doing? Good to see you. If it if it's only virtual, good to see you too, Jeff. <laughs> and so tell us about, you know, kind of your decision to jump in with both feet and go ahead and, and, and test the waters on this virtual con uh, conference concept. <laughs> So I talked about this a little bit on a random just a YouTube update, but roughly 30, 35% of my revenue comes from virtual in-person events. And plus my brand, the CTO advisor is tied to people seeing me on the cube, seeing me in at the shows, creating the content kind of on the ground, guerrilla style, kind of like how uh, John started out early on. So we, we needed, we needed a practical solution from, from both two things. One, we feed off the energy of the community. So we need to be on the ground as much as possible so that we can create content and get you guys the, the stories and the data that you need to make purchasing decisions. And two, we needed the practical problem of solving our own revenue problem. So we jumped in head in to say, let's do a virtual event. I don't know if uh, I would have done it if I wasn't as naive as I was back then, but we, we jumped in. So before we jump into the, the kind of the, the processes, make sure, give us a, a full on plug. When is it? Where should people go? Registration, I assume, is still open. Why don't you just we'll get, that, uh, get that out there for the folks? So even if you see this after registration closes, quote unquote closes, it's April 21st, 10.30, a.m. Central to 3.30 p.m. Central, that's U.S. time. Uh, you can register at ctoadvisorvirtualconference.com. Excellent. So let's talk about some of the interesting things about virtual. What, one of the things, as you said, in a physical event, you've got people, you've got time and space and geography that we all come together in that space. And there's a lot of advantages to everybody being at the same place at the same time. A virtual event, almost by definition, is now you've broken up kind of the segments of content capture, if you will, and creation, which can or cannot be on that date, the actual display or the, the publishing of that content, if you will, and then the consumption of that content, which may or may not happen on the 21st. How have you, you know, kind of worked with, with kind of this expanded palette, if you will, to be able to work in an asynchronous world and how are you finding it in terms of actually day-to-day -day execution? So you guys have done plenty of remote content at this point. When you're in the Cube studio, you know you have commercial internet. It's fairly reliable. When you're on premises, eh, maybe a little bit less reliable from the sense that it's conference center, but it's still enterprise class internet access. So you can do real time video on the Cube fine. You know, we can go to cube.tv, cube.net and, and see uh, what you guys are doing real time. And it's pretty much without blip. In the virtual conference world, what we're dealing with, where I'm coming in remote to you, while my video and audio looks fine now, it may blip. So we embrace one, two things. We embrace the fact that this is a virtual event. So in the background, I'll, you know, you'll see that we're in Keith Towns' basement. Uh, the other thing that you'll see is that we won't produce live content because there's not much value in it being live if I can't interact with you. You know, one of the great things about the Cube is that it's live, but there's this element that people are on the ground, they're watching it live, they're interacting with it live, we're tweeting about it. So how do you reproduce, if not the that exact feeling of it being live and you're being part of it? but the conversation around the content. And that's what we focused on, creating high quality video content 
that you can consume kind of as a watch party. So on Twitter, in the platform that we're using, we're having conversations real time so that you can, uh, you can enjoy the community and the speakers who are uh, presenting. You can interact with them because they're not presenting real time. They're in the chat room, they're on Twitter, they're running as their session is running and they're able to interact with you. So we've embraced kind of the medium and then after the fact, of course, you know, you, we can do all kinds of things to run asynchronous content after the fact, because the majority of the people will watch it after the video's done. Right, and I'm just curious, how many sessions are you going to have approximately? So we have, uh, I think, 21 sessions. 21 in sessions. In a five-hour period, so we're running three separate tracks, uh, two, tech, two super techy, geeky tracks, then a sponsored track is by, kind of by itself, uh, and we're not expecting everyone to consume it all at one time. Right, you know, it's just so interesting to me, you know, talking about your tracks, you know, if, if, if you were to go rent a venue uh, that had the capacity to run 21 tracks over five hours, it'd be a pretty decent size venue, it'd be expensive. And then you would have to pick, you know, kind of your sessions and your tracks based on the limitations of the budget that you had and the window that you had of rooms that you could put these people in and who could do it now, when, there, the other thing. So it's really interesting that, that now this opens up the amount of sessions is really a function of what you can manage or what the community can kind of self-organize. You're not really limited by how many rooms are in the Sands Convention Center. And the other thing that you brought up, which I think people completely miss is that if the if the content is recorded in advance and puts in the can, to your point, the presenter can actually participate in the conversation while the session is happening, which they can't do in a physical event because they're actually presenting. So, you know, we had a guy on the other day, Ben Nelson, he talked about, you know, a car is not a mechanical horse. It's not the same. Digital is not the same as physical, and there's some things that aren't as cool, but there's a whole lot of things you can do in the digital space that you can't do in the physical space. Yeah, a lot of my presenters were kind of put off by the idea of, wait, hold on, I'm not going to present live? What? How will I interact with, you know, webinar style? And I think this is the other end of the spectrum, uh, Jeff. I think you guys have probably found this too. It's not a uh, in-person event, and it's also not a webinar. So don't treat it as a webinar. You don't have to have these canned, uh, phony questions that some people have behind the scenes. It is a real authentic thing. Oddly enough, I discovered this as part of helping my church put on their worship service. I was watching the service. I'll look off the screen a little bit to the left. I was watching the service and the minister's delivering his sermon. And in the Zoom meeting, there he is playing with his little two-year-old daughter Wow, he's giving the, the, the talk, and I'm like, and I, yeah, I just open chat at him, and next thing you know, there's an explosion of conversation around just life and the topic at hand. So it, it is a really unique experience. Yeah, I think that's a really important point is not only what is a digital event, but what is it not? And it can't be a webinar. And when we were first going through this, this kind of shakeup and we were really trying to identify some of those things and we specifically did not want a digital event to be a webinar because what's a webinar? It's generally a one-way communication of information for the vast majority of the session that you're sitting there and they only open it up to Q&A at the very end and it's only a moderated Q&A that very few people get a chance to get their question in and you don't know how they're picking and it only goes to the host. So, you know, really having, you know, kind of an open live engagement around an engaged group of people with a piece of content as kind of the, the, the coalescing uh, of those people really is, it's not a webinar. It's, it's a very different kind of experience and it sounds like you're really embracing that. Yeah, it will never replace a live event. You know, live has, again, we talked about the energy, the, you know, people are like, do you really want to smell the sands, Keith? You know what? It's all part of the energy. It's, it's instant reminders to, oh, I remember when I interviewed Pat Gelsinger here, and you, know, you have these instant cues that we as humans love. We don't get that, but I think uh, it is something that's going to be with us to stay, and it will augment. I love to hear how. Uh, you guys are thinking about how being able to have this capability will augment the cube once we return to physical events. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think um, this behavior that we have now been forced to engage in in terms of you know increased working from home and 
you know, kind of increased use of video conferencing and, and, and that is a different communication mode. I think those behaviors are going to stick quite a bit, actually. I think, you know, if, if you look at um, what a conference is, you know, there's a couple different tracks, as you said, there's, there's an expression going around kind of the rally moment, right, the keynote. You know, we want, we have a strong message, the, the CEO wants to get something out. And I think that's, that's of tremendous value. But then you look at all the breakout sessions and, and the, you know, kind of information flow and the kind of the community engagement, those, quite frankly, can be done online much more efficiently and much less, uh, with much less cost. So, you know, will the new, you know, conference be kind of this, the celebration and you know basically a customer appreciation event and they want to have a party but really that it, it it I don't think it will be quite the information flow cuz why should product group A wait until the conference date if they're ready to release their information and wait for product group B or C or D so this kind of forced aggregation of the communication into this very small window of 3 days in Vegas I don't think it makes any sense you know it's 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 waterfall versus devops and if this group's got stuff and they're ready to go. Again, why, why hold the information back? It really doesn't make sense. And decouple, you know, kind of the customer celebration, the rally moment, if you will, and the education, they don't necessarily have to be this contiguous big unit for three days in Vegas. Yeah, I'm looking forward to first quarter 2021. You know, usually January, February, first half of March, really slow news channel uh, product teams release stuff and they really want some big stage to release it. I think this will really make the dissemination of information coming from product teams super interesting as folks like the Cube, the CTO advisor, we, we're able to put on independent events virtually that have a, a sense of gravitas to it that, that our partners will come and embrace. Yeah. The other thing, Keith, and I wonder as, as you've been collecting your content for your show next week, is that the pressure on the quality of the content has escalated dramatically, right? If you're stuck in a huge conference hall, surrounded by 10,000 people in the middle of a keynote that's not that exciting, it's kind of hard to get up and walk out. But if you're sitting at your desk with the entire world and alt tab away, not to mention pesky things like email and Slack and everything else that we have as a distraction, you know, it's really incumbent on the content provider and the engaged community to deliver or else you're going to lose the audience. And I think it's going to be really interesting people that overly uh, have relied on the 100 foot video screen and the electronic uh, violin music in the morning and you know, some of these tips and tricks uh, aren't going to carry the weight because if it's just you sitting in front of a screen and you got to deliver the message, it's got to be crisp, it's got to be powerful, and it's got to be engaging or people are just going to step away. And more importantly, how do you bring people back? So you, you know how when I take a break at a conference, I'm kind of captured. Eventually, I'm going to walk back to the conference and I might go back out to take a call, et cetera, but getting people to come back, even if the content has been awesome and, and engaging and great, how do you get them to come back? They don't have to come back that day or even real time, but they have to come back to the portal. So we're working on kind of the, the next 30 days after the event. This is the thing that's really funny about putting on a virtual event. You know, there's kind of the exhale after the day of the event. The virtual event, you know what? You got a third of your audience that first day, the third of the audience the, the next week, and then the rest of the audience creeps in, you know, over the next, three or four weeks and how do you engage them? How do you get them to come back and ultimately consume your content and your message? It's something that, you know, I haven't, I don't know if I've cracked the, the, the formula for it yet, but it is going to be a very interesting challenge. Yeah, but I, I, you know, I think, I think we have, right? In the way, how do you consume, how do you consume video today? How do you find information, right? You go to YouTube or to Google and you search, right? And you know, right now the biggest phenom in, in pop media is the Tiger King, right? So when do people watch the Tiger King? How do they hear about the Tiger King? When do they actually sit down and watch it? Has nothing to do with, when nothing I watch it, it has nothing to do with when you watch it, unless we decide to trade messages. And I say, hey, you know, Keith, have you seen the new episode? So, you know, when you look at consumption patterns, to me, it's really interesting. It's kind of bifurcated. You either binge watch, and just really get into something that you're into and you just go, go, go for hours and hours and hours, or you're getting snippets, right? You're getting little quick hits, quick hits, quick hits. And I think it's this, this kind of ugly middle where you don't have enough content or richness or, or engagement to have people hang, 
uh, but you're a little bit longer than a quick hit just to get your message out. And I, I think it's really gonna, you know, kind of bifurcate. And the beauty of digital is you can consume it in lots of different ways and piece parts, and you don't have to necessarily, you know, kind of sit through kind of a straight rote uh, consumption as a captive audience. So I, I think the opportunity is really, really good. If the content is up to snuff, properly tagged, search terms, all those types of things, of course, as well. So yeah, John talks about the value of community a lot. And one of the our uh, co-host on The Cube and also a Cube alum is Corey Quinn. Uh, and he does a really great job of this with curating content after it's been consumed live. He'll to his audience say, you know what, we're going to, I'm going to live tweet this session from three months ago. And that refreshes the, the, again, the conversation is not about when the content was created. It's about the conversation as long as it's relevant and finding mediums to, uh, to help amplify that message. Yeah, I think it's I think it's just a great opportunity. You know, we used to do some work with Live Nation in another lifetime, right? And Live Nation around concerts, right? They had that that particular event when you go to the show, and and a lot of their efforts on the marketing side were what they call extending the glow, right? Extending the glow after, and also kind of building the excitement before, and and moving that window of that event to more than just the night that the show played. And exactly. I think you know we've got the same opportunity here. That's why, again, if you get good quality content, it's not speeds and feeds, but it's evergreen themes that have that have legs. You know, you can go back to that well, and you can stir that thing up, and you can and get it back out there again. And then again, you know, hopefully people stumble upon it, whether it's via community or whatever. The, the other thing I think that's really interesting is you talked about community, and you talked about um, Quinny Pig at Quinny Pig. I think is his Twitter handle. Um, is this whole idea of collaboration, and I think that's another thing that we can take from the internet, and I know you do a lot of that. So, you know, working with other influencers, if you will, or other people in the communities and introducing each other's community to one another. I think it's a really big part of what makes a lot of the big YouTubers uh, famous is that they do things together and they, they kind of cross pollinate their communities. And if there's some overlap there, then, then they both have kind of a win-win. And again, I think in digital, where you don't have destruction, you don't have single use, you can use stuff more than once, it really opens up this opportunity for much more, you know, kind of win-win, let's work together and, and, and build community together across leverage versus it's either yours or mine. And it's really more of a competitive thing. And I've, I've been collaborating a lot with some of my European peers and you bring up a really interesting concept. You know, our friends at VMware is going to be put on VMworld in the next a uh, few months, and they usually had a U.S. conference and a European conference, were both pretty sizable conferences. It's basically going to run concurrently as one conference. So if it's going to run as one conference, why do I have to limit kind of the live experience to the U.S. time zone? Why can't I cater this, you know, and why is it just a fixed hour? I don't know if it will be, but it shouldn't just be a fixed hour event. It's going to be a all out hour event that's going to happen across Asia, Europe, and the US and tailoring the content to each uh, continent and time zone and cross pollinating. So that content that I would not have typically have gotten at the US event or in the Europe event, I can now get that experience and cross cultural flavor as a natural part of digital. So there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot to miss about in-person events, but I think there's opportunities that are just massively untapped. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just going to get kind of one more concept, which I don't think is getting enough action, get your, your take on it. But if you think of the value to the company, and let's just stick with, with VMware for a minute, and we're great fans of, of Pat and, and Sanjay, you know, there's a, there is a information transfer when Pat gets up and does his keynote as from one to, you know, many tens of thousands. And there's value there. And, and again, we talked about kind of this rallying moment, but think of turning that on its head, which is really what digital provides. Now there's an opportunity for Pat and Sanjay and the entire VMware senior team and junior team and product managers to now flip that information flow. So if you think of the user experience from the attendees point of view, 
Is it better for Sanjay to talk to 10,000 people in an audience? Or would Sanjay rather hear from 10,000 people and have that, that flow of information going back in? So if you, you, know, you think of it as a community event versus a one-way kind of communication of here's our exciting news, I think the value to the sponsor uh, goes up dramatically because there's so much you know, kind of uh, institutional knowledge and tribal knowledge and, you know, experience within all those people that are just sitting passively listening to that keynote. If this is a way to better suck that information back into the company, I don't think they'll ever go back to the other way it was. Yeah, uh, two, two points, kind of two data points on that. One, again, from the worship side of the house, uh, at our Easter service, our church enabled every member who cared to, to kind of do a five, eight second, uh, hey, happy, this is the Townsend family, happy Easter. And then 15 minutes before the uh, live ser church service started, they just ran a video of, of family after family after family that I recognize saying, hi, happy Easter. So, you know, you have that moment and how do you capture that online? VMware's social media team already does this well. They amplify end-user content. There was a, a guy that did a three uh, did a video on how to install VMware Cloud VMware Cloud Foundation in three hours. Went viral. You have these opportunities again to hear from sources and have conversations that's really not practical from a. Uh, typical conference perspective. I think I heard it best the other day, one of my attendees and presenters said, you know what, Keith, the conference is, the virtual conference is such a democratizing event because it's, it enables me, whether I could not afford to go to a conference before, or I couldn't travel or uh, whatever reasons I could not attend a, a virtual conference or a conference before, the virtual conference gives opportunities for collaborations that could not have taken place otherwise. Yeah, it's great. So again, Keith, thank you for, uh, for spending a few minutes with us and sharing your thoughts. And again, for everybody, April, 20, April 21st, 2020, next week, 10.30 a.m. Central Time, join the CTO virtual conference. Keith, always great to catch up, man. You too, Jeff, thanks a lot. All right, take care. He's Keith, I'm Jeff, you're watching theCUBE. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.